Thanks, Sasha. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our speakers, our panel speakers, and, and welcome to everybody um, who's listening in. Um, so this is the first of our workshop sessions and on regenerative agriculture, and um, it's featuring first-hand experiences of farmers and educators who are leading the practical implementation and adoption of rehydration restoration works in agricultural production settings. So Regen Ag's really been at um, the forefront of the, de of the development of systems and tools to restore water availability and soil health of landscapes. And it's, it's been seeking techniques that require reading how landscapes and ecosystems function and working with natural processes, agricultural processes to repair them. And in this session, um, yes, we will be hearing uh, from Gillian Sandbrook and Gillian, just a very brief intro um, on each of you all. Uh, you probably warrant much bigger introductions, but just in the in the um, to keep things rolling along, I'll just give a potted um, bio for each of you. Gillian's many things, including a very well-travelled journalist, uh, a marketer, and now an innovative farmer from the Albury region. And we have Justin Weaver, who is also a farmer, and he farms in Victoria in the Balmoral region in down near the Grampians, and he's been adopting many innovative and thoughtful approaches to regenerative agriculture that explicitly better incorporate biodiversity and natural processes. And he's also the president of the Holistic Farm Management Group in Victoria. Um, we have Graham Han joining us. Uh, Graham's worked as an industrial chemist and international marketer, meat cons industry consultant, and as well as a farm consultant to many family and corporate farmers. And he now farms beef and runs his own consultancy hand for the land. And um, last but not least, we have Peter Hazel, um, who works with the Maloon Institute in um, New South Wales. And he has many years of experience in the development and delivery of landscape rehydration works, both in the public and private sectors. Um, and he's also working on rehabilitating his own farm in the um, Mungalo watershed in New South Wales based on the principles of regenerative agriculture. So we've got an esteemed panel to hear from. Um, I won't go on anymore. I'll hand it over to them. Um, Julian's going to start and then we're just going to go, uh, everyone's going to give a short presentation and then we're going to open it up for, um, for discussion. Um, so uh, I'll hand it over to you, Julian. Right, good to work out to share the screen. Are you allowing me to share? Yes, you should be able to click the, yep, you've got it. Okay, that's a good start. Oh, thank you for inviting me today. Um, so I'm Jill Sandbrook and I run Biberinga, which is on the southwest slopes of the um, Great Dividing Range, just north of Albury, between Holbrook and Albury. Um, I've been here on Biberinga since 2007. Uh, we're on Wiradjuri country too, which I'd really like to acknowledge. And I've been a holistic manager or holistic thinking, trained um, under the sort of guidance of Bruce Ward and Alan Savory back in the early 1990s uh, when we ran a merino stud in the Riverina. So at that time, um, there was drought. We had a lot of debt. Um, there was a wool depression and things weren't looking good. So we really had to find a white line to follow. And it was at the time that Alan was very, con uh, Alan Savory was um, very controversial and he came to the Riverina and spoke at Wagga and I went to the seminar and came home and said, I think we've got to give this a go. This, is, this could be the way out of the situation we're in. So part of holistic management is about having a holistic context. And I always share this with people because at my age and stage in life, um, I actually had a very similar context back there in the 1990s that I couldn't really see that I could be achieving it. So my purpose is to be prosperous financially and environmentally and contribute socially, producing high quality primary products and to build the land to pristine and have a balance of rural, commercial and financial investment and a balanced lifestyle that embraces individuality and holistic thinking. And I can actually say now that I really feel that I'm achieving, achieving this, um, but it hasn't happened in one decade. It's happened over a number of decades. Um, so Biberinga, I'll just get rid of these people on the side. Which, so it was purchased in 2007. Um, and I've just said, this is what it looked like in 2007. It was during the millennium drought, it was grossly overstocked. And uh, the people that were owned it at that stage and two, two owners prior to that had, were living in hope. 
Um, and I was not going to be doing that. I was going to, the reason we bought Gabringa was because of all the above. And we felt that with our um, experience in the Riverina with a 350 mil rainfall, that coming into a 750 mil rainfall with the experience we had in holistic management and grazing practices and land management, that we should be able to rehabilitate the Beringa. So the, the picture on the left is looking down towards the homestead. Um, the property rises up to the, the highest point to the south and over, over the, look over the border to Victoria and the Hume Weir and the Murray River are on the southern part of the property, but we overlook it. I don't actually uh, front the Murray River. So this is the same paddock in 2020, uh, planted over 70,000 trees and refenced the property, which is um, just under 1,000 hectares or 2,500 2, acres. Uh, started with 23 paddocks and now have well over 60. And every year I'm dividing up more paddocks. So we're talking about rehydration here um, today. And and um, basically, uh, in the first looking very bare. And uh, so I, I figured I had to work on ground cover. And so I really allowed the property to rest and just get its energy back. And in that time, did the extensive tree planting and fencing and just getting to know the property. Um, eventually, when we did introduce livestock, um, we do the rotational grazing, the planned rotational grazing based on the savoury uh, platform. And I've been, I'm quite anal, in fact, about my recording. And we were on the um, Riverina property as well, that I've got very thorough records of all the grazes right back from 2007. And it was all done manually on grazing plans. Now it's all been put onto my grazing, which is a um, computer program. That's been fantastic. So I've got the whole 14 years of grazing on that, um, on, the, on the computer program. And then as the ground cover improved, so I, I maintain I've got to have ground cover 100% of the time and I will sacrifice nothing for ground cover. Everything revolves around keeping 100% all the time. And I had read back in 2007, I read Peter Andrews' book, um, Coming Back from the Brink, and talked about slowing the flow of water through the landscape and the importance of plants. Um, and I really understood what he, I felt I understood what he was saying. But as time went on and I felt that it was probably opportune to start doing some excavation work on the property. And I didn't want to do this beforehand because I felt the Beringa was so fragile that if I put any more scars in the landscape, there were plenty of man-made ones anyway with erosion and, and gullies and dams that had overflows going the wrong way and yards and roads put in the wrong place. So there was a fair bit of uh, work that needed to be done before I actually applied any of um, Peter Andrews' on-ground works. But during that um, sort of seven years, seven or eight years before I got Peter Andrews to come to the property, um, I was very mindful of it. In the plantings that we started with the bigger trees up further up the hill and as we came down the slopes into the gullies, you know, including plants and smaller shrubs and things like that and grasses. So his principles have been in the whole evolution of Biberinga since I've been here. Yeah. Um, so the first first excavation work we did, there's this is coming off the a north facing hill which is very steep you basically can and there's a waterfall that runs for about 100 meters down that slope and it comes to this gully which is now was very it had a sheer wall on it and it was a total it, it just um divided the flood plain and after the, spending time with peter um, on the property for a couple of days writing notes and sitting around the table I really started to see the landscape through different eyes. And, um, you know, he did little experiments with me with bucket of water on a slope and watching how the water just flowed down. Things that children actually play with in the yard, but I hadn't actually applied those principles to um, running a, a farm. So this particular gully has had the sides tapered so that we took that sheerness off it. So now it's grassed up and no one's down that gully so there's a third of the property is above the above this contour and two thirds of 
that is below. And the, the land structure of Biberinga is actually quite contained in its own um, catchment area, which is really beautiful. Uh, it has, it's got a great energy, the property. Uh, and also there are trees planted in that area. So my latest uh, tool is a drone and I'm having a lot of trouble, fun with this drone. And this is another little example I did. Um, although although all the, there is a stream and a name stream that goes through the property, but it's an ephemeral. And I just allowed the willow trees and all the trees that were there, I didn't care what they were and I've got no problem with deciduous trees. Although most of the, all the trees that I've planted essentially are native perennials, native trees and grasses, etc. But, uh, and a lot in that seven years prior to doing any excavation work was healing of the land and, and little leaky wares were appearing anyway. Um, sometimes I just push some uh, trees into the, to help it. But, but very little. I've only got a 40 horsepower tractor, so I've got no capability of doing anything major. So this was a little in, uh, interesting. The top left-hand corner is the stream that comes through the property. And then it comes into this floodplain, which is all, um, all reeds and phalaris, um, um, and, you know, wet, wet, wetter plants. And they, there was this little dam on the left here. And that was the main water for that point. And Peter suggests that I just rerouted the creek a little to move around the top of the dams. And then it floods to the right hand side of that bigger dam and then flows, meanders all the way around the property. I don't know if you can see my mouse moving around, but I hope I'm describing it well enough. We, we can see region, it. You can, that's good. Um, um, how am I going on time? I've still got a few more minutes. You sure do. You got, yeah, keep going. That's absolutely fine. Okay, so um, I can understand what Peter talks about when he says pushing water uphill. You know, I literally took him literally in the beginning. Now I understand that it's a lateral movement of water through the landscape. So I can see that it's moving further up th this hill. This is quite a slope here. So it's just, it's not moving like hundreds of metres, but it is moving and the moisture you can see the growth coming up. So um, the, the, new the new dam is it's basically flowing all the year now, the stream as well. And I'm doing some more work um, just down from this area at the moment. I'm part of Land to Market, which is systems through its ecologically outcome verifications, uh, where each year they have, I uh, get in, independent um, people come to the property and they do all the measurements. There's 10 sites and two baselines, and they're looking at plant biodiversity, microbiology, diversity, et cetera, water infiltration rates and other things. Uh, I really think it's important to be doing this. Um, I am registered as with my, all the trees, 120 hectares of trees for the carbon trading, but I haven't actually traded or had a proper audit yet, but I'm certainly looking at all the different options for land stewardship. Um, so uh, we're talking about rehydration today, but I can't separate rehydration from biodiversity, ground cover, managing livestock, managing the business. Um, it all goes, it's all hand in hand, it's a facet. So um, to provide biodiversity, I'm valuing life and dead wood, deciduous trees, native trees, perennials, native grasses, improved grasses. The biodiversity of biology in the landscape and soil is a key to healthy environment and slowing the flow of water through the landscape. Excuse the spelling there, I just bung, put that in. So it's just the key terms, never sacrificing ground cover. I've got a beef trading um, business. I'm running about 600 head of cattle at the moment. They're all on adjustment. I value add with um, EU, grass fed only, no hormones, et cetera. And I de-stock in low rainfalls. I have no qualms if, if they forecast, uh, forget uh, twice a year, April and November, I do, uh, make a call whether I think it's going to be a good year or a bad year. I can't, I can't make a mistake because I can always sell or I can always buy. So you really, I, I, I just make a call and uh, manage my lifestyle accordingly to the conditions. And I've diversified into rural tourism um, and doing up the wool shed, uh, which is a fantastic space, which is great for my lifestyle and social life, social life as well as um, doing something for the wider community. I only run um, art workshops and uh, agri regenerative agriculture workshops there. I'm not interested in weddings or anything like that. It's very precise what I do. 
um, we also have Airbnb and um, the environmental stewardship opportunities. Um, it's red hot at the moment. I'm just working out which way to go and how I can uh, get the best value for the, the way I'm building up the environment here and building carbon and organic matter. I'd just like to mention quickly, if I may, um, Earth Canvas is a project I started two years ago. Um, it's basically trying to get some of Australia's leading artists, and this is John Worsley, um, who is a, one of Australia's leading as, um, artists, landscape artists. And the idea is to try and get people to look at the landscape from a creative perspective. And I look at, I'm now looking as a result of working with these fantastic artists, that I'm actually an artist of the landscape. So all, all the roadways, trees, fences, anything I do on the property is a mark on the landscape, just like an artist is putting marks on their canvas or whatever they're working with. Uh, we've got, a, I've, um, this Earth Canvas has now got a travelling exhibition, um, travelling around to six locations in Australia, and we'll finish at the National Museum in Canberra. And the reason that the, the National Museum took this exhibition on, which has got 70 artworks, is because they see that regenerative that the, the um, industrial model of agriculture is being challenged and there's going to be a more regenerative approach to farming and agriculture in the future. So I think that is a real, a real seal of approval that regenerative agriculture is not just a passing phase, but it is here to stay when the National Museum takes on an exhibition based on those principles. And so the real profit drivers in my business come from the healthy soil, plants, cattle, and of course, healthy me. So that's me, thank you. Thank you, Gillian, I really appreciate that. That was great. Um, Justin, are you ready to jump on? Just give me one sec. <laughs> Not a worry at all, no problem. Okay, I'll just uh, share my screen. Maybe one second. Yep. And just a reminder to everyone that if you would like to ask um, Gillian or any of the presenters a question, you can pop it in the chat um, or you can hold on to it and we can um, we can call on you uh, later on when we get to the questions. But yeah, for now, let's um, let's watch Justin's presentation. Right. Uh, hopefully you can all see a picture with some cows. Yes. Beauty. Uh, right. Uh, my name's Justin Weaver. Um, I farm at Balmoral in Western Victoria. Uh, we've got about three and a half thousand acres of river flats and rises. Um, we're lucky in that we've got the Glenelg River uh, runs through the length of our property, plus the Yarra Mildred and Frenchman's Creek systems connect in our property as well as Mathers Creek and Claude Austin. So it means we're one of the major connection points of water in the upper, upper Glenelg. Uh, we back onto the Claude Austin Forest, which backs onto Rocklands, backs onto the Black Range and backs onto the Grampians. Uh, so we've got a lot of remnant vegetation uh, surrounding us and running through. Um, it also means we've got a lot of kangaroos and emus and wallabies. <laughs> uh, and we were hearing about um, echidnas there this morning. Well, we've got a lot of them too. Um, it's the river through our property, uh, well, as you can see from this picture, from that point towards town is all a single river. From that point back to the back of our, our property is a braided river. Uh, so it's multiple rivers, uh, multiple islands, um, uh, very flood dominant sort of a, an ecology. Um, and through that braided section, there's also multiple swamps, including two major ones, which is Fraser's and Frog. Um, as the name suggests, Frog is a major breeding ground for frogs. Uh, I mean, on top of all this river country and what have you, we've also got a lot of grazing land, uh, which is a mixture of introduced species and native species, um, depending on the type of country and the location, the topography. Uh, I'm gonna be quite uh, uh, biased and say, I don't really care whether it's an introduced or a native in the farm operation side of it, so long as it's a, a perennial and so long as it's uh, there to improve the, the overall system, whether it's the soil health, um, animal health, or um, 
sustainability of the whole situation. Uh, that said, we do have a soft spot and preference for the, um, the native stuff, mainly because it's a lot hardier. Um, just going to the next slide. Uh, we've also got some remnant um, vegetation that's quite interesting, uh, different and um, rare and endangered, such as Callistamon wormerensis. Uh, that's the one at the back of this little billabong. Uh, we're one of the few sites where it's where there's a lot of it and also where it's uh, growing in numbers. Uh, we have a lot of recruitment. And part of that is down to management of the, of the river system through the Glenelg Hopkins CMA, but also management from a livestock perspective. Uh, we found it's one that responds to um, grazing. So we use grazing in our river country on a needs basis in a pulse sort of a setting to reduce the amount of uh, introduced grasses. And we find that, that that's done in a, you know, a well thought out sort of a way. We get more recruitment of this clistamen and also a lot of other rare and endangered species. Um, the farming operation, as you would have seen from the last one, is predominantly cattle, uh, but we also have a corridor sheep operation. Um, we, we're constantly trying new things with, with our livestock, uh, but we're finding it's the livestock is a key component of how we can manage the property for the better for both the native and perennial species, for the remnant vegetation and also for the pastures. Um, we use holistic management principles with our management. Uh, we also use plant grazing, uh, cover crops, so multi-species cover crops, uh, multi-species perennial pastures. We also uh, brew biofertilizers and biostimulants um, ourselves. Uh, if you'd like to see something amusing, just look up in YouTube, Glenelg Bitter. Uh, it's a project we did with the CMA and uh, turned carp into a biofertilizer. Um, it's a lot nicer to watch it on YouTube than to smell it in person. Um, our journey in this, whole way of thinking and farming started uh, years ago when I did a grazing for profit course. And at the time I couldn't work out how to institute and really bed it down. Uh, then when we moved to Balmoral, I met a bloke that's coming up in a few minutes uh, by the name of Graham Hand. And uh, basically everything we've done since I blame on him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, he's been, he was instrumental in getting us to take the next sort of steps um, and start trialling things and one thing led to another and, and now we're, yeah, well and truly into the whole thing. Um, one of the key focuses of our farm is working with nature and rather, rather than against it, whether that's following the rhythm of the seasons with our enterprise design, uh, making sure we're growing the right plants at the right locations, um, making the farm fit the environment, not the environment fit the farm. Um, and I think part of what we're showing and we're achieving is that we're able to retain the native vegetation alongside uh, agriculture um that it's that it, not only is it possible but that it, you can actually make both thrive uh that it uh, is a a um, saying that a lot of people have said better than i over the years um that it's not the cow it's the how um that the management of uh is key to what you're going to achieve um on this slide you'll see there's uh some orchid shots i took yesterday um, we've got lots and lots of different orchids coming up in our, our highest stringy bark country, uh, which, as I said, periodically gets grazed. Um, there's a shot of uh, one of my sons with some thumping great big uh, toadstools. Uh, we're finding that we're getting increasing amounts of uh, toadstools and mushrooms of all different shapes and sizes coming across the whole property. Um, down in the bottom, 
left hand corner, there's a minor species of uh, grass tree. Um, we love those things. That they they uh, grow in a specific area on our property, and that paddock is one has one of the highest lambing percentages and calving uh, percentages, purely because of the the shelter that it provides from from the elements for newborns. Um, these things all working together, uh, and it's yeah, it it is possible to have your your cake and eat it too. Uh, we found, and that um, it just all comes down to how you piece everything together, um, and uh, that involves getting things a lot more wrong, more often than right. But you learn from that, and you uh, you take the next step. Um, but that's probably everything from me, unless uh, we get to the question section. Amazing! Thanks, Justin. No worries. Great, um, Grant. You ready to go? I am, I think. I'll just do the share thingy. Yep. And very good. Um, thanks, Sasha. Thank, thank thanks, you. Justin, as well. And that was great too, Jill. Really liked it a lot and liked Darren's a lot. So I was just going to quickly skim through a few slides um, and just sort of talk about this whole idea of doing safe to fail trials. I was fortunate enough to work with and be trained by David Tongway. So it's really influenced my view of um, managing the landscape. I missed a, something that I wanted to say. I also manage stiper native grasses. So got a fair bit of experience with managing and regenerating native grasslands. So we use grazing and cropping to regenerate native grasslands. And David had a big impact on that. Um, I really like it because really highly opinionated old people like Colin Sice um, can be trained in this and also include myself in there. Um, I have a definition of regenerative agriculture that includes increasing landscape function and biodiversity. Uh, I've tried to develop a definition that's actually got um, that you can measure each step, each of the triple bottom lines. So. Um, it's sort of also the foundation of the Savory Institute EOV. I'm a I'm a uh, accredited to provide training through the Savory Institute and Holistic Management International, and also the people scoring, uh, increasing well-being scores and profit stable uh, or increasing. Current production agriculture doesn't work. Um, and I say, if Australia was your farm, you're going broke when I'm doing a presentation. But basically, this is debt in the red. This is the gross value farm production. And they, they're forecasting that it, uh, ABES is forecasting that it's going to be a record high. I don't see those sort of changes happening, but it could is possible. But the one that I keep saying we need to be talking about is this net value of farm production. It, this is a forecast. I don't see that and if it does do a little blip like that I think it'll return to that long-term trend so it's not, it doesn't work so there's not a lot going for it everyone thinks we've got to damage the land to increase that and uh, and that's not true so um just quickly there's three main barriers to successful landscape function grazing um, I get people to determine sort of what management rapidly regenerates their land and what things to avoid. So how do they decide what are the lowest cost, lowest risk things that you can do? Um, so using safe to fail trials, and I'll talk a bit about those. Developing convenient infrastructure, I'll talk a little bit about that. I see that as the next biggest barrier. Once you know what to do, how, how do you actually put that into action? And it requires flexible fencing and water. And then uh, the animal phenotypes and adaption. So they're not selected to thrive under the management that increases landscape function. So if you're giving them uh, fully recovered grass, um, you know, total recovery of the grass and grasslands and the recoveries that regenerates, you know, the native grasses, you've got to have animals that are adapted to that and selected for that. Um, why, why safe to fail trials? It's because it helps people see the patterns and understands the responses and the boundaries. You're not trying to find an absolute answer. You're just trying to work out, well, how does my land respond? So 
The next couple of photos I've got right at the extremes of the um, densities and recoveries and plant utilization, because that's what I found that works and people haven't seen it work. The other thing that I really like about safe to fail trials, this is work done by Dave Snowden, is that it reduces conflict. And I love that first sentence, you know, before opinions harden, you create a very simple decision rule. So if it has the remotest possibility, you, you do an experiment, you do a safe to fail trial. So I don't think there is actually a time before people's opinions harden, but if you then actually compare them all, it massively reduces conflict because this is, conflict's just going to continue to increase as we go. Um, so why safe to fail trials? This was during uh, the 06, 07 drought, and this was the property that I uh, sold a couple of years ago. But when, when it broke in that drought, and it was a pretty significant drought, it was the same photo, same time as that photo of Gillian's Bibaringa. So like we had clear runoff when it, when it broke at the, the end of January, 2007. And within a couple of months, we had that level of grass. So clear water, um, yeah, it was a big rain. I, everyone said, oh, it's, it was forecast for 100 mils. And I, I told everyone it wouldn't happen because it was a northwest in feed and all that sort of stuff. But it did happen. And we had some runoff, but we captured enough, stopped it leaking to actually grow that level of grass. And people go, oh, yeah, so it was a fair bit of rain. But this is the comparison. This was best practice farm management. Um, over the same time on the left and on the right, the DPI uh, long-term phosphate trial. So, and which had been de-stocked for all of the summer. So it was incredibly different. It wasn't just a little bit different. These things can do extraordinary things, but we, we need to change the way we think about the land. So this is an example of a safe to fail trial in the um, Midlands of uh, Tasmania, I kept telling the sheep not to look at the camera, but uh, like uh, a lot of, like uh, Justin, when I am tra was training him, he wouldn't listen all that well. And they kept looking at me, but that was the sort of density that we did. We measured landscape function before, we measure landscape function afterwards, and we use landscape function to design the target that we're heading towards. So increasing that landscape function. So knowing how to do these, how the land responds. That area grew grass right through the winter in the Midlands, which they hardly ever see. So um, this is uh, where my cows are in New South Wales. And I'll just try and uh, play this. It mightn't have the, uh, mightn't have the, the sound. So um, it mightn't play. Yeah, so this is um, an, automatic gate lifter. This is the way we've been grazing. So this has been what they've eaten during the day. And I'm talking now about the gate lifter and how it shifts the animals automatically. I couldn't get any closer. They weren't used to the drone. Like Gillian, I've been playing with the drone. I really love the way those calves run up. Everyone moves to the fresh grass. So, um, yeah, so we're using that. This is a night paddock. So this is the area that they've got for the night. And then I'm talking about if we're going to mimic nature, um, we need to know what nature looks like. And I think we've forgotten a lot of the time. So this is a clip out of uh, David Attenborough's Great Plains. And I was talking about the colour change there between the left and the right and the density at that front of where they're grazing. Um, and yeah, so it was really just to give people an idea of how we manage and, and what level of utilisation we're going to. So I'll just stop that there and go to the next slide. This is, um, this is the satellite data for ground cover, farm map 4D for the same property. And, um, and this, these are the sort of the three stages that I talk about. So this is pre-holistic management training. If the, if, the, if the graph is below the 50%, it's got less um, ground cover than the, uh, the surrounding area. Here, conventional holistic management planned grazing, lots of bouncing around, trying to buy animals, sell animals, get stock density. And then um, Peter and I just implemented 
um, you know, landscape function grazing as I've been landscape function plan grazing. I don't know what to call it, with safe to fail trials. So that actually worked really well. Um, and this was after the drought, um, uh, in, you know, when, the, when it rained after the drought, Peter didn't have to feed. Um, it all went really well. This is another, um, uh, this is another, um, just using these. I'm not saying you have to graze like this. I'm just saying these, this is what people are doing. How do you make it convenient? Well, they make it convenient by automating it. And I think we sort of need to know that that was the way it did work at that incredible stock density. I always advise people to watch that Great Plains video looking for these sort of things. So um, this is the type of management that we do. It regenerates native grasslands, um, you know, and you would have checked whether it did or not in your safe to fail trials. It leaves the ground covered um, with high landscape function. Um, and then the next one, um, which I won't play, is uh, just from Benjamin, because uh, he, this is one of his safe to fail trials, which uh, luckily Darren did all the pre-work for me in Somali land. So what, what I did was I implemented plan, uh, safe to fail trials and plan grazing with Benjamin, and that was how he regenerated all that grassland. And as a final slide, I'm really keen on um, developing a predictive model of the grazing factors and how they feed into landscape function. Um, it's what I use all day, every day. Um, you know, if you want the land to be cycling nutrients, it's got to have composting litter. You know, it's got to be covered. If you want water infiltration and high nutrient cycling, you've got to have a lot of each hectare covered with the basis of perennial grasses. So that was, that was about all I had. I hope that was okay. I feel like I rushed a bit, so. No, that was great, Graham. That was really good. It didn't feel rushed. But well, we definitely good. have we definitely have opportunities for people to clarify things during the Q&A um, as well. So everyone feel free if you want to ask um, Graham a follow-up question, get it ready. Um, Peter, looks like you're all ready to go. Well, he last, yes. I'll just yes. bring up my presentation. Perfect. Share it with everybody. Okay, great. Yep, we can see that. Okay, just uh, try and fill the screen. There we go. All right. Uh, yeah, look, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's great to be invited to this Leaky Landscape Symposium and uh, I'm probably following on some from some pretty inspirational talks. Uh, I hope I can live up to to those talks with, with mine. Uh, and Graham, you, if Peter uh, Reynolds, happens to run out of grass down at his place, you're quite welcome to bring him up to my place. Uh, um, I think they, my place could do with a bit of a mowing as well. Um, anyway, I'm speaking to you from Ewan country in Southeast New South Wales, uh, and I just wanna pay my respects to uh, elders past, present and emerging. We define landscape rehydration as taking actions that encourage the greater retention and cycling of water in the landscape for the benefit of farm productivity and biodiversity. And I think you could probably argue pretty well that the previous three speakers uh, would fit with that definition pretty well with the way that they're managing their landscapes and, and advising. Um, Maloon, Rehydration Initiative had its genesis back in 2005 when the late Tony Coote, owner of Maloon Creek Natural Farms and later the founder of the Maloon Institute, invited independent landscape thinker Peter Andrews, and for those of you that have never seen him before, that's what he looks like, uh, to his property. Uh, they quickly agreed to work with each other to restore the function of the creek system running through the 100 hectare floodplain floodplain pocket on Tony's farm. The 23,000 hectare Maloon Creek catchment comprises a series of floodplain pockets that step down through the valley. These floodplain pockets have been described as containing discontinuous watercourses, i.e. not a single continuous channel. Tony contacted his neighbours, as well as the Upper Shoalhaven Landcare Network, 
of the Southern Rivers Catchment Management Authority to garner support for a natural sequence farming demonstration on his property. And with some reservation from a couple of his neighbours about how the proposal would affect water quality down, uh, water availability, I should say, downstream, the proposal was given broad community support and the Southern Rivers CMA agreed to play a supervising role in the project. So in 2006, a demonstration was established with the help of the National Land Care Program and involved the construction of many bed control structures, colloquially known as leaky weirs, and the planting of thousands of plants along a three kilometre stretch within a floodplain pocket of Maloon Creek. The aim was to raise the water level of the creek and to slow and spread the flow in the same way that Gillian described in, in her presentation. While there were certainly challenges during the implementation of the project, in the end, a successful outcome was achieved as it related to restoring the function of the creek itself. The important goal of fully re-establishing the functional connection between the creek and the floodplain has probably not yet been achieved due mainly to regulatory constraints. However, with the limited monitoring that there was of the pilot project, it has provided some insight to the hydrological, the agricultural and ecological outcomes of the project. In 2011, Tony Coote established the Maloon Institute to support research, education and advocacy that integrates agriculture and the environment. In 2014, Tony wanted to go big with the demonstration. So he invited all the other landholders along Maloon Creek into the tent, albeit with some neighbours still having concerns over the landholder, over, albeit with some of the landholders having concerns about stream flows and so on, uh, all the landholders along the 50 kilometre stretch of Maloon Creek and its tributaries agreed to participate in a catchment scale project now known as the Maloon Rehydration Initiative. The project would involve over 20 landholders across much of the catchment. It would be fully benchmarked and include a long-term monitoring program that would provide insights to regenerating degraded landscapes with strategic interventions and adapted farm management. A central tenant of the initiative was to address the ongoing erosion within the catchment, and in particular to re-establish the functional connection between the creeks and gullies and their associated floodplain pockets, a combined area of several thousands of hectares. And so the overarching research question for the project is, what is the effect of stream interventions on the ecology and farm productivity of the landscapes within the Maloon catchment? Maloon Institute's Science Advisory Committee, which includes hydrologists, ecologists, hydrogeologists, geomorphologists, soil scientists, social scientists, and any other scientist that perhaps wants to get involved, is overseeing the setup of a triple bottom line monitoring framework that will answer many of the biophysical and social questions that this project poses. Now, a key aspect is to understand actual lie of the land. This image is a high resolution 3D image of Lower Maloon derived from airborne LIDAR. Less than 200 years ago, this was a discontinuous stream system. 200 years ago, it did not have the single continuous channel which you can see in this image. It was a chain of pond system with multiple flow paths, both official and subterranean. Moving in a bit closer, the high flows would have been low energy and would have spread across the floodplain through all of those runnels that you can see in this picture on either side of the main erosion gully. In some cases, Maloon Creek has eroded 10 metres down into the floodplain sediments. So a key goal of the Maloon Rehydration Initiative is to begin to raise the level of the creek again so that the energy of high flows and once again dissipate across a greater area rather than be concentrated in a narrow and deepening trench. And in so doing, multiple co-benefits will emerge. 
with much surveying, planning, design and documentation to gain government approval, we have now installed a further 40 structures in the creek along a distance of 15 kilometres and across five more properties. This is a vertically exaggerated long section diagram of part of the creek system. It depicts the relative heights of each stream structure throughout a three kilometre stretch of Maloon Creek on one property. A key consideration when siting and designing stream structures is the height difference between the ponds you are recreating. In this case, we can bring the whole stream up by about a metre in one go, provided the relative height between the ponds is kept to between 300 and 500 millimetres. This has a dramatic influence on the amount of water that can be retained, not only within the creek to trickle out slowly over time when it dries out a bit, but also in the floodplain itself. Um, I'm talking potentially gigalitres worth. So you're about to see an example of a structure that was built at the end of 2018 into a part of the creek that had eroded to bedrock. And you can see that the banks are still actively eroding in this shot. So a strategically placed structure and a bunch of transplanted vegetation with some reseeding. And in two years, this is a now, now a vibrant part of the creek system. And this is now repeated throughout the system where we have undertaken this work. This is another drone shot. I've got a drone, which I love uh, playing with as well. <laughs> a great innovation. Uh, this slide is a shot of stage one of the Maloon Rehydration Initiative taken from Kings Highway and looking upstream. The structure in the previous series of slides is at the bottom of the picture. It includes 14 structures across three properties and 3.5 kilometres of creek. Note the greener tinge that is demarcating the floodplain boundary. It's early days yet, but our numbers are already telling us that this could be due to the rehydration work we're doing in the creek. This slide depicts Maloon Creek one day after the biggest flood since 1974. The 1974 flood caused major erosion and changed the course of the creek. As a result of the recent works, this August 2020 event had the opposite effect. For the first 200 years, the 20 kilometres of creek where we completed the works, for the first time in 200 years, I should say, um, the creek showed no signs of erosion, only deposition of nutrient rich silt onto the floodplain. This is the same shot of the creek a few days later, of the same part of the creek. And this is two months later. It's important to note that the creek structures have been placed at points where either the creek would naturally left, uh, where the water would have naturally left the creek or naturally have re-entered the creek. Um, yeah, please check out the website uh, for more information. Uh, there's, there's a lot going on with this project uh, and thanks for listening. Well, thank you again for everyone um, for your presentations just now. Um, I'm going to hand um, over to Sophie and Paul to facilitate this um, yeah, interactive workshop from, from now. Thank, thanks, Sasha, and thanks for those great presentations, everybody. Uh, really tremendous. What, what a broad um, picture of some wonderful work that's going on. It's very heartening to see. Um, Oh, so many questions that are coming in. Um, I'm going to um, be a bit of a hog and put one out myself to begin, if that's okay. One, one for you, Justin. Um, to, I was just wondering, um, to what extent do you feel like you've been able to, um, I guess, increase your productivity by undertaking um, the sort of management practices that you, you've adopted? Um, and... And, and have you seen, uh, has, that, has that allowed you to actually possibly put more 
um, of your property aside um, to pure conservation for biodiversity. So I'm just thinking about productivity gains and and um, and whether that's enabled you to sort of actually be able to, um, you know, put yeah more into particular to manage biodiversity specifically um, grazing grazing aside. Hmm. Um, well, that's a fairly expanded sort of a question. Uh, <laughs> From a product, productivity perspective, we are running um, more head of livestock as far as uh, a DSC, so a dry sheep equivalent, um, than when we first arrived 12 years ago. Uh, we And then we're doing it comfortably. Uh, the property with the benchmarks we set environmentally is, is ticking them. Um, this year was a struggle, but you get good years and badges. But the general trend is that we're, we're ticking all the boxes as we're going. Um, from a profitability perspective, it's definitely improving. Uh, and there's a worthwhile enterprise, that's for sure. Um, as far as being able to lock up more land, I have one location on this whole property that is just a no-go with stock. That's it. Uh, everywhere else there'll be grazing. It might not be for a few years, um, but it's done for particular reasons. So on our river country, we have an agreement with the CMA. Uh, it's under riparian leasing. So we can graze it every six months for two weeks. Now, we don't do it every six months, but we definitely do it at least once a year to once every 18 months. Uh, because we have a lot of phalaris through uh, some of that river country and also tall wheatgrass. Uh, and as a way of reducing competition for natives, uh, by opening up a lot of that grassy sort of kind of understory um, to other plants to sort of turn up. And also as a bushfire uh, remediation work, we'll put large numbers of stock through for short periods of time. And it, we see that as a key to the results we're getting as far as um, rare and endangered orchids, uh, small shrubs, grasses, just turning up. The sheer volume of insects, frogs and, um, and birds that we see and the increasing numbers we're seeing because of the way we're farming and utilising the livestock within that structure um, it is proof to us that, that it works, but it's the management that's the important part. So I hope that covered part, yeah, at least half of that question. No, no it did, Justin. Thank, thank you very much. Interesting to hear that, um, yeah, that there's not many places that you, um, you lock up totally and you need to. It's just judicious management. Um, and, I mean, you showed us pictures of orchids. Was that an area that's under... Away from grazing, or um, no, no, yeah, and, and I think no, Paul, that, you had a area that, yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say that's an area that um, sees cattle through every year or so, mm. um, and they they don't disturb that area too much. They'll move through, have a bit of a pick at it, um, but that's about it. And we we find that. We've actually got more of a problem from all the kangaroos and the wallabies because they won't move on. They tend to stay in those locations and we see more destruction from them in those orchid areas um, because of that. Um, I don't know what the solution to that one is. Mm. Uh, well, you yeah. might want to follow up there with a, a question uh, you had. Well, I'll just ask a question on behalf of um, Barry. Um, just is a, is a question to Peter Hazel, I think. Um, he makes the point that the calculations for the leaky weir work, you know, must be complex, which which makes sense. And then he goes on to ask, uh, when I see the question, um, is the whole project paid for by government? The answer is uh, yes. Um, it is a fairly complex process uh, doing the planning and getting the approvals to do uh, the work in the creek. Uh, uh, we have to get approvals through var from various government agencies, actually. Uh, and the answer to the who pays for it is that uh, essentially the Maloon Institute itself paid for 
the cost of the planning process, uh, but we've gotten government grants um, through the New South Wales Environment Trust mainly, and more recently, National Land Care Program to actually do the implementation of the structures in the creek. A key aspect um, with the Maloon Institute, it, since Tony passed away, uh, he bequeathed his farms, Maloon Creek Natural Farms, to the Institute. It's actually a very profitable farm. It's got quite a profitable egg operation. And so uh, it's the profits that have come from that operation that have enabled the Institute to be able to function in the first place. And, and I think that's one of the principles going forward in regenerative agriculture is that it's got to be profitable really. And, uh, you know, this is part of that principle is putting back into um, improving the environment, uh, some of those profits from that enterprise as well. Thanks, Pat. Um, I just wanted a follow-up question perhaps directed to Justin again. Um, my experience in central Victoria is that native pasture in, in sort of agricultural land in grazing country is actually much more prolific than people seem to appreciate. So I think a lot of farmers often don't even know that they've got it. And I, and I noticed on your place, I'm pretty sure there are areas um, of kangaroo grass pasture. I just wanted to know how extensive they are and how much of, of how much they play into your management and how much you'd like to encourage that that sort of um, pasture in the future. Uh, well, kangaroo grass, there's a bit, not as much as I'd like. Um, I would love more C4s. Um, I love a lot of things, but C4s is definitely one of them. Um, wallaby grass everywhere uh, and different types. Uh, it's especially in at key times of year, it's, it's a mainstay uh, for a lot of our cattle operation, especially. Um, but spear grasses and all, all different types of native grasses, forbs, um, understory through the place. It, depending on the paddock and the amount of introduced competition, um, so the percentage might only be 5% or it might be 50%. Um, weeping grass, we're seeing a much bigger and bigger footprint year on year. Um, and it's, it's appearing in, in places we haven't seen it before. Uh, I love more of that as well. Um, as you might have gathered, I, I love more grass because grass gets turned into cow or, or sheep and yeah, that pays for this whole thing. Um, but yeah, the, the native grass is definitely increasing and increasing importance too because we don't use uh, fertilisers to speak of, um, you know, tiny little amount in a couple of cover crops, that's about it. Uh, herbicides to a degree, but no pesticides, no fungicides. Um, and the natives are far more resilient uh, in a lot of situations on more degraded soil types. Um, so need less babysitting. Thanks, Justin. That's great. Um, I noticed that John Fawcett has a question and I'm not quite sure who it's directed to, John. So could you speak and tell us what you mean? Uh, I'd love to know what I mean. Paul, <laughs> um, now look, thanks everybody for us, the intimate talks. I, I really enjoyed them. Um, I'm a hydrogeologist, but I also deal with, you know, models that deal with reservoirs and urban water supplies. And, and this is sort of a loaded question, but I'm really interested about this water budget um, issue and, and whether, you know, groundwater is monitored. I'm, I don't know if you were there this morning. It, it's, it's sort of the poor cousin groundwater to compared to surface water. But one of the things that's really struck me today is looking at the examples of how you're controlling the water flow, holding the water up, is that when state governments or water authorities do catchment yield modelling, they use really generic um, factors of the land use of what the runoff may actually be. And there's, you know, New South Wales uses a model called source. Source model predicts all the reservoir inflows. And I would imagine that the water budget that you guys are creating is considerably different to the information that's actually put into these catchment scale models. So the point is, is the change, is the spatial area the change that all you kind of farmers are doing, is, is it actually significant enough that it actually, that information needs to be pumped up to the state government? Would it actually change a whole reservoir catchment water balance? And in the research, is someone trying to 
unpack the water balance. And just last question on that. The reason why that's really, really important is because I, in Victoria, there was a dry land salinity world. Uh, I don't know whether Justin and I ever met, but I spent a lot of time down in Balmoral with my PhD. And the dry land water table theory was actually wrong because they got the water balance wrong. And they invested millions and millions. They sold Telstra for it. And I'm just wondering whether people are looking at this properly so we understand the water balance scale to inform the impacts of climate change, but also yield, et cetera. I don't know if you can answer that. That was just on my mind. Sorry for the long-winded question. Anyone on the panel? I, oh, I yeah, I'd like to have a quick go. Um, we're actually, I've, I've tried working with universities. So at Sydney University, I was an adjunct associate lecturer in Melbourne University and UTAS and stuff. And all I've decided to do is just work with farmers. So we know that uh, areas like around Wellington and the central west of New South Wales, it's massively changed the water balance. But trying to get people to look at it, John, and think about it, it's just, it's just, like I've been saying, cut out the middleman and to go and bang your head on the road first. So what we do is just work with people until uh, we get to that. But yeah, there's an incredible change. We The lowest cost, lowest risk thing to do is to increase landscape function through farming practices, and which increases the water infiltration, the water holding, and it just changes from there. So we address a lot of runoff issues by just increasing landscape function. Any other comments on the panel? Otherwise, I'll get Sophie to do another question. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to jump in. Uh, we're, we've got a lot of instrumentation in the system measuring the hydrology, uh, and it's very expensive too. I might add, measuring hydrology is probably the most expensive yes. monitoring you can do. We've got five stream gauges down through the system. We've got about 75 piezometers in the system wow. as well too. Yeah try and uh, get a picture and and we've got several climate stations to to look at that full water cycle aspect of the hydrology as well um, and uh, because one of the biggest concerns as I said in my presentation is this idea that if you start to put structures in the creek then you're going to be holding up more water you're going to be pinching it from downstream yeah um, and I think most of our regenerative farmers would probably appreciate that in fact, growing a bit more grass is going to slow down a lot more water than just a few structures in the creek. Um, but the key thing is, uh, you know, getting that water into the ground so that it's available for plant use, uh, a lot of it, and then it's able to cycle through evapotranspiration, condensation, and so forth um, over time. But the measurements that we've taken so far um, are demonstrating that, in fact, because we're retaining more water through this work, uh, that more water is actually available uh, in the creek system during those dry times. It just basically doesn't dry out as fast. Uh, so we're increasing that, that resilience to both droughts and floods. I don't think, sorry, Paul, I, I think that's really important because it's, it's, you know, there's, there's always that commentary, you're, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. And, you know, and, and the answer to that is in that water balance. So if there's any papers that you've done recently or whatever, if you could forward them to Sophie or Paul or some links, that'd be really appreciated. Thanks, Peter. We're getting there with the papers. We've got one in press at the moment. Uh, Look forward to it. Can I just add a comment there? Yes, please, um, Oh, Just from a very raw um, landholders' perspective, um, I'm finding with the contours, I've got some quite long contours around the property now, some two, two and a half, three kilometres long. And along those contours, there are outlets and the contours are on the contour. They're not graduated at any stage. And I'm finding that um, if I'm keeping the water as high as possible for as long as possible, then I'm actually utilising the water better. Of course, I've got ground cover in place. And at Biberinga, I'm... I'm the water that runs off the property is basically only six kilometres from entering into the Hume Weir. So, um, and I noticed with the springs, there's a lot of springs on the country and that is all, um, when, the weir, when the weir is over 60%, it seems to be the springs are springing for longer. Um, it's very <laughs> subjective sort of observations. But, uh, 
I also think physometers, I've had a fair bit of experience with physometers and the Riverina on, on the South Artesian water base. And the fluctuation with those was uh, interesting to watch as well. I used to um, monitor those monthly. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, a couple of questions have come in on um, sort of flood mitigation and the role of leaky weirs in that. And, and you've all touched on it in various ways, Peter, particularly. In, in, um, so I'll, I'll, read, I'll read two of them. There's one from John who said, here's the question. There's a creek that runs through an area of town near us, Seymour, it sometimes floods and damages town assets. If leaky weirs are established along it, and particularly in its catchment, how would the floods be handled? In other words, does this sort of treatment affect flood flows? Um, Peter, you might want to comment on that. And, and it links into a question that Francine has also asked about um, what the, the, whether there's a noticeable dis, different dis, uh, impact in the 2020 floods uh, from your leaky weirs, Peter, in that system you're talking about. Uh, yeah, well, essentially, you're, you're slowing the water down, you're spreading it out, so you're de-energising, so the floods are not going to have the same impact on the infrastructure because there's, there's less energy. When you're getting floods as big as they were in 2020, there's a, that's a lot of water, and that's basically what floodplains were designed for and how they came about is that they take floods. And so perhaps a wise thing is not to build on a floodplain um, if, if you're talking about infrastructure uh, Sydney at the moment are about to raise their Warragamba Dam wall 10 or 15 metres to try and mitigate the effects of floods on Sydney so as they can develop the floodplain um, down there on the Hawkesbury and so you know wise and water scientists are saying just move the infrastructure off the floodplain because eventually we will get a flood that will over top even a 10 metre higher Warragamba Dam. So uh, we, we have to really think about uh, how we plan our landscapes uh, going, going forward, I think, as it relates to floods. Uh, we have tried to channelise for so long now our, um, our waterways to, to manage floods, to get the water through a bit quicker. But what that has done is increase the energy and then therefore has increased the damage that the floods have been causing. So um, whereas the event and, you know, I was pretty nervous when that flood went through in August because we quite literally still had a digger in the creek finishing off a couple of structures. And I was expecting to come back and see them all gone, but they, they all worked together really well. And we ended up having a, a regenerating event as opposed to a destructive event, um, which is what floods ought to be, um, is, uh, is regenerating these floodplains, building the floodplains as opposed to eroding them. Fantastic, Peter. Um, I've got the next next question. It's really a bit of a, a coupling of two. One from Jenny Rowland, which is how do you build weed management into your farm biodiversity operation? And the second one is from Francine Noble, which is related and is directed to Justin um, about management practices changed, have management practices changed the weed types and diversity on your property? And I think um, Graham also had a response there. So maybe a couple of you can respond to those questions. Uh, um... How you manage weeds or how you see weeds, I think, changes. Uh, what you see as a weed changes. Um, I've, still, I've definitely still got a few weeds that I hate with a passion that boils down to my very soul. Um, I have just now ignore it more often um, because I realise that uh, they're just a plant that I've given the opportunity to come up. Um, so it's, it's looking at it from a whole system perspective. Um, I'll still use herbicides on certain types of weeds in our system uh, if I can't use um, livestock. Uh, there's certain ones that I know that are difficult to get around or if, say, I'm putting in a cover crop where I want uh, lack of competition to really build up the organic matter so that I can keep a lot more litter on the ground I might use uh, a glyphosate to go through, um, or I might use a spray seed, depending on whether the perennial annual balance or, or something specific to that particular weed that I know is going to be my big competitor and that can take over rapidly. Um, but more often than not, now I'm looking at the paddock thinking, well, the cow's going to eat it. And if I get the management of them right, the weed's going to be outcompeted anyway. 
And I yeah, just, I, sorry, go on. Sorry, Paul. Um, I was just going to just sort of, um, there's basically two types of weeds that we run into. There's the annual Forby type and there's the woody weed type and they're at different ends. So the annual Forby type, the cause of that plant, the major, major cause, so about 70% of the time, it's because the the recovery between grazing events is too short. So if you have thistles or cape weed or those forby types, that's telling you the recovery is too short. If you're getting woody type plants coming back, woody weeds coming back, then it's usually from stock density too low and utilization too low. So they're quite different up different ends. So typically people will have blackberry or woody or rosebriar or that sort of woody regeneration where it, uh, they're getting too low a stock density and not enough um, animal impact. And up the other end, the frequency of uh, the grazing defoliation is too frequent. So it depends which end. So. Um, I just like to comment there. Um, when I came to Biberinga, the first thing that came up was Patterson's Curse. And I had beautiful paddocks of purple. And Mrs. Patterson actually lived only 10 kilometres down the road who introduced Patterson Curse to Australia. So um, I just uh, I took the social consequences because everyone sprays it. And they, the question was when I went to local things was what are you going to do with your Patterson's Curse? And I just sat it out and I uh, did introduce the, um, the weevil from Tumbarumba. But basically, it's just gone. And any Patterson's curse that comes now is spindly plant that doesn't suffocate and doesn't blacken the ground. And similar to what Graham's just said about the woody weeds, blackberry, briar, and whorehound, they have been an issue on the place. Um, I've just done in the in the gullies and wetlands in the Phragmites uh, wetland areas. I had some blackberries that was the size of a big house, and I've just put an excavator, had an excavator pull all that out and made a big pile. And I'm not sure what I'm going to do. I'll probably have to spray when it dries out because um, thick black soil are those little plants that come up. Um, but I'm certainly not going to let it get away again to that extent. I was hoping that something would happen. And the devil's claw as well, which I pull out. Um, and thistles, I can just hoe those out if I wanted to. But I let them go till they're about to flower and then let them just die there. I don't pick them up. And that's Peter Andrews says the there's no such thing as a weed um, and I agree most of the time with him but I don't agree on um, blackberries and briar I'd certainly manage those thanks Helen. great Peter are you going to say something yeah just quickly um, to riparian areas that often are the most difficult areas to manage weeds such as blackberry and so on especially if you change the grazing regime every weed under the sun comes up uh, if it's been actively grazed for many, many years. And so uh, what we've actually found is that, uh, well, first of all, all of the system has been fenced, but it's been fenced far enough back so that you manage effectively inside that fence, perhaps with grazing as well. The most important thing is you look after the structures themselves or the steps in the system and, uh, and, and manage the vegetation accordingly. But these chains of pond systems, they used to be bank full most of the time anyway. And so um, there wasn't cliff faces uh, that you had to manage the blackberry growing up along. And so once you start bringing the water level back up again, it's actually a much easier task managing the weeds along the riparian area. And with the work that we've done, we, we've drowned acres and acres of blackberry. And we've also now inundated quite a lot of willow which is uh was planted in the 70s to um, address the bank erosion and we're just watching and waiting to see whether that uh whether the willow likes having its feet as wet as it now does so yeah it's just a much easier task when the landscape starts to work better and you've also got the native vegetation has a better chance as well in uh competing with the with the weeds we We've got uh, amazing regeneration of native vegetation in the in the ponds zone and riparian zone going on. Thank you. I've got I've got a I, when I tour through central Victoria often this time of the year you do see big paddocks or parts of paddocks that are just full of yellow or purple or, or other colours depending on where you are and 
uh, it seems to happen sort of recurringly in, in this time of the year. And uh, I often have conversations with farmers that, you know, who, who are brought up in the tradition of say set stocking or large paddocks. And they know that they'd like to do more holistic grazing and have more resting to try and, you know, not have to sort of go down the track of using herbicides against those, those plants, but, but they don't do it because there's a perception of it's too hard or it's too expensive. So how do we persuade those sort of people to, um, you know, to take the step and, and, and transition to a, a different approach? Happy to have a little go. I've, I've spent the last 30 years, Paul, trying to work on that. Um, and the only thing that I can find is to do that, um, to do the safe to fail trials. Alan Savory used to call it look see trials. Um, but we need to somehow have people being successful. The biggest problem I see with the regenerative grazing is that people are saying they're being regenerative when they're not. So what I say to people is we need to increase our success. And if you're any good at regenerative management, your paddocks should be better than the roadside. And if your paddocks aren't better than the roadside, which is getting zero management, then you're really not doing regenerative management. So I'm saying the problem we have is uh, enough success and of enough people and then um, stopping the people that are saying they're doing stuff that aren't, it's actually got to be measurable, and then giving them the option of doing the safe to fail trials to just so that they can, in a low conflict way, investigate what happens to their land when they change that. And a lot of people find that the, you know, putting in a little trial will stop any weed problems. Thanks. Any other comments from the panel about that? And then I might hand over to Sophie and Sasha to wrap it up. Uh, I'd only say that another thing is um, people that are actually using holistic management and cover cropping and all the, the different styles of, of that fall under Regen Ag, um, being open and honest about it. Um, so talking to neighbours, uh, allowing people to see your place, being open about what works and what doesn't. Um, farmers tend to learn better off other farmers. It, it, it's just, it works that way. Um, we can, we get inundated with different uh, academic studies thrown at us all the time and it's straight over the top or straight into the bin. Um, whereas if your neighbor's doing it and it works and it makes more money, you do it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's being open and honest with the general public about what you're doing and why. Nice. Thanks very much. Um, we're going to have to wrap it up because we've got another workshop to move on to straight away. Um, that was a fabulous session. I um, want to thank you all, our speakers, um, for coming along and giving tremendous talks. Um, you're all very inspiring examples of what can be done. Um, I heard that we are all learning to see the landscape in new ways. We learn to see how it functions and um, we're trialing to learn more about how to restore function. Um, you're innovators in that space and you're leading examples. And I think to actually get this stuff picked up more broadly as I think it needs to do, um, examples like these are just ever so important. So thank you for coming along today and sharing them with everybody. We really appreciate it. And um, we can hope we can keep the conversations going. I hope this is just a start. So thanks, everybody, very much. <laughs>